I'm very lucky to be the caretaker of a stunningly beautiful Oxford reference Bible from the early 20th century. The reason that it's in such good condition is that it seems to have never been used and it's in its original box. This video is about the box, not the Bible. The box was probably not meant to be kept, but I think it's a wonderful book-related artefact made by people in the bookbinding profession using trade methods. In the next two videos, I'm going to make a model of this box, and in the process, you'll see how I analyse an object to work out how it was constructed and how I go about trying to replicate it. I could go on for longer than you'd be willing to listen about this Bible, but I'll try and hit some of the highlights. I've already found my first mistake in my assumptions about the Bible. I'd assumed it was from the early 20th century because it was so similar to a dated Bible from this period. However, the head printer for Oxford University Press is listed as Charles Beatty, who was in charge in the mid-20th century immediately after the war. It's a semi-limp binding with yap edges. All three edges are gilt by hand with real gold. You can see the burnishing marks, which confirms this, and its age means it could have been done with foil. The text block corners are rounded, and the paper is this amazing light but very strong India paper, which made Bibles portable and large encyclopedias possible. The box has been made in the typical trade method of scoring and folding. You can see inside the lid that the walls are not separate pieces, and the corners are where the joins are. In the second video, I'll look at the board thickness, but it's about 1 to 1.2 millimetres thick, plus the covering and lining material to give a total of about 1.7 millimetres thick. You can see signs under the covering material at the edges of the scoring of the board and the subsequent folding. I think it's very clear when you compare it to an example of a scored and folded piece of board. In this video, I'll just make the lid and I start by taking the inside measurements. If you mark and score the outside of the board and fold it, these outside measurements become the inside dimensions, and the outside is slightly larger by the thickness of the board. See how the inside of the lid is a straw colour rather than a grey board colour? It's been lined with paper. Pre-lined board is a common product in production environments. I have an example here which has been lined on one side, which would be perfect for this project. But it's not as easily available for hobby binders, so I won't use it. I'll line some board myself. The board I'm using is 1mm acid-free grey binders board, a generic board used by bookbinders. Now you're thinking, how do you do that with this thin board without it warping? I have to line both sides so that the pull balances out. I'm also going to minimise the pull by using a drier, thick PVA adhesive and a dense but thin paper. I'm using Mohawk Superfine 118 GSM. Normal white copier paper would also be perfect as it's dense and thin. The Mohawk isn't the bright white colour, which is the main reason I'm using it. I glue out the Mohawk and apply it to the boards and then press it for a few hours using uncoated pressing boards which wick moisture away, and then let the line boards air dry. In the end, I have nice, flat, rigid board. This approach of scoring and folding is very different to the approach of cutting individual pieces for the walls, which has become more typical in hand bookbinding. In the production environment, the folding approach makes much more sense, especially if the box is likely to be discarded. This approach is much faster and usually more than sufficient. The majority of books is made in trade environments, whether for books or just about anything, would have been made this way. Box making in this method is poorly documented. 
I think the best source by far is Franz Zayer's book, Books, Boxes and Portfolios. Just about everything I know about making boxes this way is from this book and observations. Once the board is dry, I cut it to size and score the lines for the folds based on my measurements. Remember, the inside measurements are marked and scored on the outside. The difficult part to model making is understanding the details, which are often hidden. Luckily, in this case, there are lots of lumps and bumps showing through the covering material. Often this isn't the case, especially when it comes to the spines of books. For a year I've been researching trade-made stiff board bindings with the aim of making a video about a model of a specific book. Unfortunately, all my historic examples are in really good condition, and I can't work out what a typical approach to sewing was. You're thinking, I have videos on this, and surely the sewing matches one of the methods I've used in the video. The thing is that I'm wanting to model an English-bound book. And for the video, I used Peter Verheyen's research on German-bound books, and the slight lumps and bumps I feel in my English-made book doesn't match what I did in those videos. I'm finding it harder and harder to find original bindings with typical wear, such as broken hinges or detached spines. This is why the indiscriminate restoration, deconstruction, or even worse, discarding of even relatively modern books is going to have a very negative impact on the future study of bookbinding history. Now I have the folded lid, what next? Is it just held together by the covering material? Looking closely at the lid, we can see at each corner there looks to be a tab of paper under the covering material. In Zaya, and at least one other source, there's reference to edges being reinforced with strips of paper which can wrap over the walls. I think this would be for a more permanent box and there's no sign of it in this lid. I think there are simply tabs of strong paper glued around the corners which don't wrap over the walls. You can see what I mean in one of my mock-ups. I cut four pieces of mohawk to about the same size as used for the lid and glue them in place. Now that I've mentioned adhesive, I'm sure they used animal protein adhesive, or glue as they would have called it. PVA is our modern equivalent in what I'm using. Paste made from starch would have been too wet and slow for this fast production environment. I think you can see the telltale brown colour of the hide glue through one of the inside corner joins. I am using rabbit skin glue more and more in my work, but I'm still getting used to it, and it's very different to using PVA. And I want this project to be accessible to a wide audience, not just people who have access to protein adhesive. I will use it in a future video.
Now the foundation of the lid is made, it needs to be covered and we have to go back to the original to work out how this was done. Let's work backwards. The top layer of covering material, the last one to be put down, are the ends. We can clearly see these were cut at an angle but not too much. The outside corners are covered by flaps from the long side walls. We can see a line under the end piece that extends up from the corner at less than 45 degrees. I'll use a piece of paper to see if I can mock this up. The key to working out the angles is where the material wraps over the edges of the walls. The covering material is an embossed paper made to look like cloth. I'm lucky enough to have about a hundred sheets of a very similar material which I got from the estate of an amateur bookbinder and I suspect he got it second hand as well. It could be over 50 years old. I've looked through a lot of old and new sample books to find something similar. I found a very good match in the Schmet sample book. FR Lin Papier, Neulein und Pragun, Dunkelblau, Artikel Nummer 1152114 or Eflin Paper New Linen Embossing Dark Blue. I'll mark out the covering material and cut to size. The measurements of the covering material are from the outside of the lid. With the thick white pencil I end up being a bit generous with the covering material and I trim it down later before turning in over the walls. You might have noticed the edges of the covering material is ragged like it's been ripped. I'm sure it has been ripped. I think this would have been for speed but I'm not sure. I can cut material very fast too but you have to remember the tools they were using were different. They didn't have Ulfa knives that stayed forever sharp. They were more likely to cut material with shears in which case tearing would have been much faster. That's my theory and I decided to cut anyway rather than wreck my covering material trying to tear it. I glue the lid to the middle of the covering material and then trim out the corners in the method worked out earlier.
I make a very considered decision to apply the glue to the lid instead of the covering material as I'm confident the PVA with this material will not cause wrinkles to form. To cover the walls I will apply the PVA to the covering material as this is the easier approach but I do get a few very small wrinkles but I get away with it. I notice there are similar wrinkles in the original but you have to look close to see them. The turn-ins ended up too large, as mentioned before, so I trimmed them to 10mm. The next question is how to turn in over the walls at the corners. Looking at the original, I'm sure the covering material hasn't been trimmed at all and that it's simply folded over and smooshed down. Looking at each corner, there doesn't seem to be any effort to make them the same. There is some excess material that's going to produce some sort of pleat. This hasn't been pushed down in a uniform direction in each corner and I do the same, letting it go where it wants. Once the sides are done, the ends can be turned over the walls too, which is straightforward. I just need to cut the thumb notches and apply the label, but otherwise it looks pleasantly similar to the original. The bottom tray is covered differently to the lid. It's covered by wrapping around the walls, like the second method of tray covering I demonstrate in another video. I think it's worth its own video. 
I hope you've found model making of an historical example interesting. I love analyzing historical books and trying to replicate them. And I'd like to make more videos like this in the future, but mostly about books rather than boxes. As always, I really appreciate you hitting the big thumbs up button. If you're able and want to, you can support the making of more videos like this through Patreon or with a one-off contribution, and the details are in the description below. If you want to be notified of my future videos, please hit the subscribe button. Until next time, cheerio.